Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the full year 2019-20 results presentation conference call and live webcast. I am Shari, the Chorus Call Operator. I would like to remind you that all participants will be in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can register for questions at any time by pressing star and one on your telephone. For operator assistance, please press star and zero. The conference must not be recorded for publication or broadcast. At this time, it's my pleasure to hand over to Mr. Arne Dekaldowski, CEO. Please go ahead. Try. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, good afternoon to everyone on the call. Thanks for your interest and taking the time. As you've seen, we published our fiscal year results 2019-20 this morning, including uh, some commentary about the current trading in the COVID-19 times. Uh, I have with me Thomas Bernhardsgrütter, our head of IRR, and uh, Hartwig Reven, our CFO. And as usual, Hartwig and I will split the presentation. We're trying to get through in probably 45 minutes to have ample time for the Q&A here. Looking at page two, the standard disclaimer, everybody I trust is well aware about it. If we go to page three, um, I think I just want to kind of take a step back and reflect a little bit on where we're standing because it's a somewhat unusual fiscal year report out. Um, I think if we were two and a half months ago, we would be sitting here and hoping that we finish our year with the momentum we had and would feel good about it and just talk about all the positives and we would probably go on some slides a little deeper. Um, but um, I think we had a good finish uh, relative to the circumstances, uh, but we're obviously in a somewhat different time at this point of time. So we want to reflect that, and you can see this here from the bullet points in covering first the report out on last year. I think that's important, um, A, because we have lots of discussions around it. want to make sure you see how we delivered on the things we shared with you as we were going through the year. Also want to make sure that you see the strategy we've put in place uh, in action and also have a fair chance to say how is Sonova doing at the core before COVID because I think that's important to keep in mind on what's your momentum and how do you keep your momentum even if you in between have uh, a pandemic as we have at this point of time because we strongly believe that if you're in a strong position coming into it and you sustain that position, it should sit well with you when you're getting out of the pandemic. Obviously, lots of things to be done and decided as you go through the in-between phase here. So from our point of view, delivered well above expectations, at least the ones we put out uh, when we entered the year. Um, nice market share gains across the business, minus on the AB side post the voluntary field corrective action. Um, momentum coming on the one side from innovation, but we also see clear signs that our focus on commercial execution as well as expanding sales coverage at the right places is paying off and adding incrementally to the top line. Uh, good margin expansion, not just because of the strong top line growth, but uh, structural improvements uh, starting to chip in and good g &A cost management. And then if we look at the March, depending on the geo, obviously China was earlier than others, already some impact in the numbers and we're trying to kind of peel the onion here as we go through the presentation. And then in the new world, from a COVID perspective, recognizing this somewhere in the second half of March and putting a robust plan in place uh, taking decisions on where they were required from a safety, protecting the core, finances, OPEX, as well as uh, top line side. Um, now sitting at a point where uh, I think it's not an absolute surprise, we have not put out a quantitative uh, guidance for the year. Um, I think lots of discussions around it, but at the end of the day, quite a difficult territory to navigate and be clear on what the next 12 months are. So we will guide through on where we stand and where our head is and, and take any question. We've shortened the slide deck a little bit. So some of our normal um, 
pages are in the appendix. We do not intend to go through them, but I know that based on uh, the way you built your model, some of the information is helpful rather than you trying to figure it out um, on a spreadsheet. So um, please refer to those pages. Now jumping to kind of the highlight, uh, the high level report out or report card here, <clears throat> all in including the field corrective action and the COVID, we had an 8.7% growth in LC for the full year. And from an EBITDA adjusted, and you see what we're adjusting for, being the restructuring, and uh, which we have announced as we're going through the year, and the uh, AB one-time cost, uh, we ended at 10.4% uh, EBITDA growth in LC. The EPS at 11.6, a couple of ins and outs, which Hartwig will go deeper on. And then uh, because we had discussions around guidance and changes to guidance in February, it was important for us to try to portray here what our performance was February year to date, so ahead of any significant impact of COVID. And uh, we were... Uh, clearly double digit from a growth perspective, and we were on a pathway to more than 150 basis points in LC. And that point is particularly important for Hartwig and me because we understand first half year there were some question marks in the room. Just want to make sure that uh, what we said at that point of time with regard to being able to generate leverage uh, does exist as a capability in us. Last point here, and this is uh, as of April, um, we have, given COVID, uh, taken one of the actions was how do we uh, get a very strong liquidity position. We've stopped the share buyback. Uh, you've seen we're proposing a dividend in shares, which we have available to us rather than a cash dividend. But in addition, we had a good uh, cash performance in the company, added a bond uh, three weeks ago with $330 million. Swiss rank and have extended credit lines so that we're at this point of time from a, um, access to liquidity above a 1 billion mark, which we find uh, the right action at this point of time given the uncertainty we have ahead of us, just to be on the safe side. Um, from a summary perspective, I want to just focus on the things I haven't mentioned yet. Um, I think important to note, and, and sorry, we have more than one adjustment. Well, there's a page in here, I think page, page 10, which unpeels the onion. There is one which we have not rolled into adjustments. I want to be very explicit about it, and that's the third bullet point. Because of COVID, we have assessed our accounts receivables, particularly on the wholesale side, and we've taken the, I think, prudent approach to build a bigger allowance for bad debt than we normally have. So that's not in the adjusted number. This is in the number as we reported it, underreported and adjusted, but there is 20 million which we have put into allowance for bad debt. So in that regard, you would see an EBITDA margin expansion of 90 basis points if you would say that is really COVID related rather than the operational performance. You see the growth rates here, hearing instruments, the highlight for us in this year, uh, relative to the others. Other ones were good too, but 11.8% uh, in LC. Despite the March getting weaker, clearly continued progress on the Marvel platform, but also the steps we took on channels and, and uh, commercial execution. Audiological tier 6.5, it's a little lower than it was in a half year. If you mentally would correct for... Uh, what we did see in the March from the COVID, you're in the same range, and in, in, in both half years, we would have grown share. And then cochlear implants, unfortunately, uh, hit by two effects here, the field corrective action, and on the other hand, the COVID, which in uh, CI at this point of time is uh, actually more severe than on the HI because so many hospitals are out of doing elective surgeries. Um, uh, quite a dramatic reduction of the growth relative to the half-year point in just 3.4. Um, a good momentum on the 
system sales, and I'll comment on it, what it was prior to the feed corrective action. Last point I want to make here on EPS and cash flow. Again, Hartwig will go in more detail, but the strong operating free cash flow was driven by many things, but if you go to the operational side, a very strong focus and improvement on the accounts receivable throughout the year, not just in the last month, as well as improvements on the inventory side. So really process improvements at play in order to uh, improve our balance sheet position here. On page seven, our best attempt to um, unpeel the onion on uh, the impact of March from a sales decline and the accounts receivable perspective. You see the guidance midpoint on the left from February. You see our reported results on the right-hand side. The AR allowance uh, follows out of 20.3 million, as you see on the chart. That gives you uh, quite some impact on the EBITDA. And then the sales decline, larger than 130 basis points calculated for the full year, has the respective impact on sales and EBIT. And, and so you can see here kind of the rationale for the argument on the February performance. On the major developments, I think what you see here is a continuation of the execution of the strategy we have laid out and which we have reshared with you uh, last uh, summer. I think clearly innovation is important. We brought out the marvel. We have 2 million units sold after 16 months only, which is a big number by far the biggest we've ever achieved in 16 months. And then with the Marvel 2.0, we've made improvements which kept the momentum. We have also implemented or elevated our uh, MyPhoneArc application to a level that we have very good ratings from consumers relative to the peer group in uh, how much they like it. And you can see it uh, in the published data on the on the uh, download number, which uh, uh, went up quite some since we launched Marvel 2.0. On the AC side, many geographies running in double digit, uh, UK, France, Austria, and the Nordics. Um, there's one name missing from here, which is a big number for us, which is Germany. Um, not such a strong performance at double digit here. Uh, driven by the third bullet point, you may remember we talked about that we want to get to one brand per country. And we shared, Christoph shared last year, that the one lagging one is still Germany, because when we started after the Audio Nova acquisition, we had six brands. So we concluded the brand integration, everything under gear. So Vita Acoustic went away. That is operationally not an easy task, so we have done this in the last 12 months, and uh, I think from here we have the benefit and not the headwind anymore. And then on the CI side, strong momentum on upgrades and sales, and on upgrade sales uh, driven by the two new uh, processor functionalities we launched in the spring, and we had double-digit system sales until we got uh, to the end of January. The field corrective action had quite some impact here. Um, with that on page nine, I think you can all read the numbers, only, only spell out here. Um, good leverage on the gross profit, keeping some puts and takes in place, including the continued kind of increase on the rechargeable side as well as some FX effects we have in here. The OPEX at 10.4, Hardwick will unpeel the onion more. This includes the bad debt, so you can mentally deduct this from the 10.4% growth. EPS, uh, significant in and out with regard to the Swiss tax reform, um, which you see on the, as reported as a positive benefit here. And then a very strong operating free cash flow performance with 55% more operating free cash flow than we had the year before. Page 10 is the one I referenced with regard to the adjustments. I think three buckets, the restructuring cost in improving the footprint. This was predominantly on the HI side, some on the manufacturing, but more in, uh, in retail back offices in Germany, as well as the consolidation of sites in the U.S. for retail and audiological care. Then the one-time cost of CI, a little bit larger than what we had uh, shared in February. 
And then uh, the Swiss tax reform impact here, which I'm sure Hartwig will voice over later. So if you look to 11, this is uh, in a bridge format, the sales side. Um, you get to a 9.1. So far, I talked about 8.7 out of the um, out of the field corrective action in CI. We have the new product available by end of March uh, in 80% of the markets, but not in 20. So if in those 20% somebody was handing back uh, a device, we needed to do a credit note. That's the 11 million here. So the 8.7 is not correcting for that credit note element here. And then you can see we had quite some FX impact on the top line and even more so on the bottom. 12, um, how did we do by region? I mean, keep in mind, we have not adjusted anything for COVID, so the percentages on the right-hand side in LC would have been a little higher uh, if we would have not had the March. Um, I think EMEA, good number, uh, slightly above market. Asia Pacific, different mix, good progress in China until COVID, that hit harder there. And then obviously a very strong number here on the US side, mainly carried by HI. Lots of positives from product to the new private label contract. With the product, the strong rebound on the VA side, but also what we did from a commercial execution side. And then on the AC, a high single digit in the year before, we were double. So post the restructuring of our network, we're catching more top line per store. This is uh, pretty much same store basis here. We're not doing significant acquisitions in US at this point of time. From an EBITDA perspective, you see the 30 basis points uh, on the first step of the bridge, 61 million in organic lift. This would have been higher if not for the 20 million in debt. Hence, you get to the 90 basis points if you would correct for this. And then significant restructuring, CI voluntary field corrective action. And then you can see still a quite significant effects effect here for us. Um, the split by half years, the first half year was overall faster from a growth perspective, but has hampered down the second half is those two effects, A, the A, B coming from strong positive into negative territory, and then the start of the COVID side. Um, from an EBITDA margin perspective, I voiced it over the 90, if you would take the second half you would be at 120 if you correct for bad debt. And that's what I meant with an improving leverage because at the six and a half top line, we've gotten to 120 basis points, if not for the bad debt in, in the second half. Hearing instruments on page 16, most of the things I voiced over, you see a little bit better um, EBITDA margin expansion because it was uh, going backwards on the cochlear side. Ongoing growth investments in R&D and go to market. You will see that later in the OPEX bridge. Um, and from a product perspective, really, the expansion to Marvel 2.0 and then pulling all of the Marvel benefits towards the, and the made for all phone, which we still have as a unique benefit to the Unitron and Hansa Tons gave us a broad-based boost to the revenue side. Um, going only on the hearing instruments, I think you can read how we did organic versus acquisition. The acquisition was in, in line with what we've done historically from a bolt-ons perspective, but obviously a strong organic growth here. And if you look at the bullet point under the table, you can see the margin expansion without the bad debt quite strong in the HI business in the second half of the year. Uh, quite some good performance here. On the cochlea world, really a story of two worlds. And it's unfortunate that we not just had COVID, but also the voluntary field corrective action. Um, 
but ultimately it made us have limited growth reported and at the same time a significant step backwards on the EBITDA margin perspective. Um, I think we continue to drive our uh, productivity initiatives. I think if you look at the P&L overall, you would say if you would have known you were at 3.4, you would have probably not done the one or other growth investment. And I think, as you can imagine, while you're going through the quality work we had to do, there's specific costs and specific things you do which we have not put into the into the one-timer. So overall, I think the second uh, half year was low on revenues and uh, a higher cost than what you would have liked to have at that kind of a revenue line. Um, and that's the financials of that. And uh, that is obviously a pretty drastic change in the second half versus the first from the top line. Now, keep in mind, 11.1 million are credit notes, but it's still a step backwards, even if you would add that back. And uh, it has pushed us to having a loss in the second half in the CI business. Keep in mind the two circumstances, a field corrective action and, and, and a COVID situation. Quick comment here where we stand on the voluntary field corrective action. Just a quick recap. Um, we have initiated that field corrective action based on observations we had over a period of time of a low number of, um, we call it degradation of performance of implants, meaning some of the recipients couldn't hear better anymore with the implant based on some impedance issues. It was a very small number. We were still below the quality threshold we've given ourselves until which we have to trigger, but we had the concern. We also had worked on an improvement for the device, and so we triggered this uh, middle of February and had to pull the inventory out of the hands of the customers who of non-implanted devices, and that led to replacements at places where the new product was approved and other markets it wasn't approved and we needed to do the credit notes. Um, we are end of March at a place where about 80% of the market potential we have approvals. It is improving with every week. Uh, these are lagging countries where regulatory approvals take longer. Um, you can see the one-time costs here spelled out in more detail. I think what's important in such a phase is that you focus your attention on uh, gaining trust back where you may have lost trust with the uh, customers, and that is what the team has done over the last couple of months. You can imagine lots of uh, meetings uh, at the beginning in person, now more virtual in the COVID environment, where we uh, guide the surgeons through what we've changed on the product, why it's now uh, better and uh, why the timing was the right timing for when we made the change. And uh, we're now at 93% of the top 100 accounts being green or yellow in our color coding. That was significantly different eight weeks ago. So relative to our own plan, we're making good progress to reconvince the customers and probably the best metric to measure that is 90% have either reordered the improved device or have signaled this uh, with a clear commitment Post their COVID-19 non-implantation. For that, I want to hand over to Hartwig, and then I'll come back on the outlook. Thank you, Art. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, so I'm, page, I'm on page 23, um, and you see um, a number of bullet points that, are, that aren't already voiced over, so I won't repeat them. But let me just elevate one or two items and then elaborate uh, further in the subsequent pages. So you see under Operating free cash flow, um, the improvement, it's a 55% increase year over year. This year we had a, a cash inflow of $112 million from receivable collection. Last year it was an 85% outflow, so it's almost $200 million just from that, um, and allowing us to, to show cash conversion over EBIT, adjusted EBITDA of, of just over 100%. Um, looking at uh, total shareholder return, um, and balance sheet, uh, you see that we are proposing not a cash dividend, but a, but a dividend in kind with, with company stock, uh, a share per 150 shares owned. 
uh, which is around uh, you know one franc thirty five um, at the moment, um, and it's it's down from prior year, but it is uh, uh, we believe the right thing to do to preserve cash, which is a subject uh, that I want to transition to uh, here. Um, we had four hundred fifty million uh, gross cash on the balance sheet, and we've collected another three hundred thirty. You have just heard this early on, so we feel in a very comfortable position. Uh, of um, actually having access to around to, to more than a billion Swissies um, in the um, you know including the uh, the committed lines that we have uh, with uh, certain uh, Swiss banks. Um, page 24, you have seen that, um, but let me just identify here um, the Swiss franc delta versus local currency delta. Um, and uh, just point your attention to that. Uh, so the Swiss franc has once again strengthened, um, and uh, so that gives gives us a, a, you know, quite a spread uh, of more than 500 basis points in the adjusted EBITDA improvement, um, and uh, around 300 basis points in the on the top line. Uh, return on capital employed. Uh, let me just quickly say that uh, this is. Around 20, 20 and a half percent in both years last year and this year. If there was no uh, IFRS 16 impact, so we have adopted IFRS 16 the first time here. Then moving on to page 25, talking about the uh, OPEX here, uh, you see that we have um, pulled through at full speed in R&D. 10.8% uh, uh, in local currencies year over year, so slightly ahead of our uh, top line um, growth, sales and marketing about in line with our top line growth, and GNA on the face of it, um, double digit, but if you take out the extra um, receivables provision, it's uh, between five and 6%. Um, and if you would compare first half and second half, you would see that in particular in second half, we have been working pretty well there. Um, and for the year, as you remember from the first half, there were also some um, long-term contract provisions that we had to accommodate here, so pretty good results uh, from my perspective. Um, out of the one-time cost or adjusted cost that uh, Arndt elaborated early on, there is 43 million landing in OPREX, uh, which is why you see them uh, mentioned here. Uh, page 26 talks you through from um, adjusted EBITDA, uh, all in Swiss francs, all the way down to net profit, and so really not um, big swings between reported EBITDA and profit before tax. Uh, and you see here um, that uh, between uh, before and after tax, uh, we have uh, the Swiss tax reform impact, which we have now uh, considered here at 64 million. In the half year, we had um, identified a, a number of around 150 million. Uh, and so uh, the reason why that has changed relates to that in uh, December, uh, the Swiss tax authorities have published or have advised on further transitional, um, you know, parameters uh, that we are accommodating here. And let me tell you that we are accommodating it in a very conservative uh, way. Uh, underlying tax tax uh, uh, tax rate around 15%, which is in line with which, which we have guided for the midterm after the tax reform um, and uh, accommodates for um, a bit of a negative from COVID-19, uh, which um, relates to that in, in a number of countries, we are now loss-making in the distribution organization and we are reserving a little bit of the tax loss carry forward benefits there that's why it is a bit over the 15, else it would have been a little, a little lower. Page 27 uh, talks you through the operating free cash flow. As you see, we are normalizing out the repayment of lease liability, so it is overall robust against uh, the IFRS 16 change, and I guess we have talked about the 55% increase there. Page 28, uh, balance sheet, uh, nothing that you would not have uh, already expected from what I voiced over. Uh, net debt to EBITDA uh, by now 0.8. Uh, page 29 talks you about talks you through our liquidity position and debt position. 
So you see um, the uh, more than 1 billion access accessible to us on the left side and our debt position with the maturities on the right, ti on the right side. Uh, and as uh, we have emphasized earlier on, uh, it has been a priority for us to have deep pockets in um, the context of COVID, um, giving us more options uh, to, uh, to handle uh, risk and opportunities that come out of uh, those conditions. With that, I return to Arndt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arndt, Vic. So, as already indicated, an uh, update and some voiceover here on the recent trading. Um, the two columns on the left, the share of Sonova and the April is Sonova. The right hand is commentary on what we see in the marketplace. Um, and I think the the first kind of significant aha is the pure sales level in April, which was only at 35% of our prior year sales level. You can see that Apex doing better. EMEA in the United States uh, are at the 35 and America is around the 20. Um, if I start with the better performing one, China as a geography largely recovered. A little bit of a question of this pent-up demand. This is already a stable volume. We do not have audiological care there, so we're living more of what we hear from the wholesale customers, Australia and New Zealand improving, although New Zealand was on a very low level given the, the strength of their lockdown there. And then the, let's say, most dynamic region right now, given that some geographies are starting to come out of lockdown, is, uh, is uh, Europe. Uh, the first ones who are showing more sign of activity, Austria, which came out of lockdown, I think, two and a half weeks ago, Germany. Uh, Nordics was always not in a not lockdown, at least not Sweden. And what we're seeing there is if we're looking on the appointment level, we're looking at something in the range of 30 to 60 percent appointments relative to historic. So clearly not people coming back very quickly. The first ones are starting to come back. I'll talk in a second on what we do from an AC perspective there. And then the U.S., as you would expect, quite a mixed picture because you can't look at the country as a holistic block given uh, how many states are moving fast versus slow coming out of the lockdown. But I think pretty much comparable there. The ones who have eased their lockdowns, we're starting to see the first consumers come back. Now, if we wrap our head around this, I think, and that makes it, uh, I, I think for us right now, probably quite challenging. There's obviously a question on how many stores are open and when are they going to open. That's the first step. And then the second one is how fast does the average consumer come back? I think we always need to keep in mind the average age is 71. And we've defined them quote to quote as the risk at risk population, right? And so... We do see some coming very early, um, but it's hard for us to predict right now how long does it take until, let's say, 95% of the people are coming back. So as such, we would look at the curve right now. I know there's always discussions about the curve. It's clearly not a sharp V, given how muted we are still. Um, looks a little bit more like a U-shape. How fast is it? I think that depends on uh, the two things. How fast are the people in a large number willing to come back? And then the second one, uh, how stable are these recoveries by country? Um, we hope that everyone can move to the positive. But I think if you look at different approaches of countries of getting out of, out of the issue, they have quite different scenarios people are trying here. I think a second comment uh, or a comment on the CI side. Um, in the Western world, um, as well as in, in, in China at uh, the early stages there, uh, the market went into an almost complete lockdown with regard to no elective procedures get done. And, and even the pediatrics, which we would argue people need a, an implant rather sooner than later, uh, but even those were all in the big challenge the hospitals had uh, defined as electives. We're now in a world where the first hospitals are starting to do surgery, but not at the level in which we're seeing the recovery happening on the HI, although HI was already not so high 
Yeah, so in that regard, I think depends very much on how really the hospitals are working through all of the different procedures. But right now, they're on a lower level than the HI businesses. Um, so that was what we wanted to share. I'm sure there'll be questions around it. Um, from what's our game plan for the COVID period? As I said, in March, we wrapped our head around this and said, look, let's define three phases. There is the first one, well, highest focus on health and safety. The second one, and we're predominantly in the second right now, which is protecting the core. And then there will be a phase of prepare for market rebound. Now, depending on the country, those phases move differently, right? So in reality, it's a mixed picture, but it's still more in the protect the core here. Health and safety is always important. We keep the measures up. Went very early to full home office where possible. We've taken quite uh, extensive measures in the manufacturing environment, uh, A, to keep our people safe, but secondarily to not get in a situation where we may be quarantined. One side comment here, we had no issue uh, with regard to uh, supply chain or manufacturing. I think most of you know we have a factory in China, but we were, as soon as the government allowed any factory to reopen, we were reopened. Um, so I think supply chain quite uh, robust here. From a cash flow and liquidity perspective, we voiced almost all of the points over, but we pulled every lever we had because end of March, it was even less clear to us than today how this is going to evolve here. So we, we really wanted to make sure we take a, a full opportunity on the liquidity side. Uh, from a cost containment, we decided to keep R&D as it was planned because we know innovation is important and we wanted to make sure we're not getting our roadmap all over the map because we will come out of COVID and we still want to be the leader in audiological performance and, uh, uh, and uh, consumer interaction. Um, but outside of that, we also on the sales and market on the sales side and on the audiology side we made sure we kept all the people and if somebody leaves we're replacing because we know they are scarce assets and we have stores and we have territories. Some of them may be on Kurzarbeit, but in principle these were the areas where we said they're not going into we do not replace. Everything else we're super careful if somebody leaves to replace. We are using Kurzarbeit uh, in all places where it's possible or government subsidies in the different shapes and forms. You've heard, I'm sure, from other companies that many countries have adopted the model in their own shape and form. And so we leverage this to the full extent. We have also cut uh, non-critical activities and all outbound marketing while consumers don't come to the store. Certainly something we are considering step by step in the markets which are starting to pick up. Um, for maximizing the revenue, and I have a slide on that, um, obviously using what we have on the remote side, A, in order to realize some revenue if possible, getting people back, uh, often in a scenario where they come for one visit but do four visits on a remote side, but also in uh, keeping us active on developing those capabilities. Um, and a big focus with regard to the sales force and the audiologists to constantly reach out to customers and consumers so that the leads are there when the market is starting to come back. Um, one quick side comment on solutions here, and uh, times of crisis sometimes uh, make you a little fast on certain things. Uh, we always had remote fitting. We had the marvel but in order to give an independent or our own store the ability to do the whole journey for a consumer, uh, if the consumer chooses to do that in a distant way, we had to uh, complete one step, which is what we call audiogram direct. So for a first fit and fine tuning, if we would send you the hearing aid, we could with audiogram direct do the fitting we would expect that eventually the consumer comes back to the store for other adjustments on the device, but uh, there are some cases where we're selling completely online where this is from a regulatory perspective also appropriate. I must say that the number of consumers who want to go this route is small, not different than what we thought a year ago. 
There are few who are willing to do this. We find more consumers who are rather waiting two weeks until the store opens to do the diagnostics and the initial fitting in the store. Um, the other comment is to be a good citizen to our customers. We're providing in some markets by now the customers, particularly the independents, with hygiene equipment and safety equipment because it's easier for us to source it than them. On the audiological care stores, we went into leveraging Quilzabite to uh, a significant extent where it's available. You have to imagine that some of the stores we closed completely. The vast majority we kept open for a few hours a day because we also feel an obligation to help our consumers with repairs and other things they may have. In some markets, we could sell a new hearing aid if somebody was asking. Take Germany as an example. In other markets, the regulation, like in the UK, was you're not allowed to sell anything. You can just repair. But in principle, our stores could operate because we're counted in the medical devices, which in almost every country got a pass on not having to close. But again, differentiation between repair only versus sales. The current focus is on uh, first um, getting obviously back to the people do, who aborted the process, because at some point of time, people didn't go anywhere anymore. We're quite positive on what we're seeing as a momentum there. They want to conclude the process. The next way is about renewals of existing customers in the database. And if we say enough traffic in, in the market that external or, or new consumer lead generation through uh, campaigns would make sense, we would move to that. But we're quite careful there because we want to see sufficient pull through with regard to the sales at the end. And on the in-store side, um, quite an extensive work even when we connect with the customers via the phone to walk them through what safety we provide, how we make sure people feel welcome and safe. We only allow one person on the customer side and our audio in the store. We do not allow walk-ins uh, in, in most of the country. So lots of hand-holding with regard to signaling clearly that it's extra safe the way we operate here. So with that, pulling it back up to the highest level, um, there's no question in our mind that this is an attractive market with attractive fundamentals. The world still doesn't have a high enough penetration of people with a hearing loss having a hearing aid. The elderly population directionally is growing and having more and more money. And so I think the longer term outlook hasn't changed for us. But the in-between is tricky as we have laid out, and we uh, want and have to navigate that. We feel that with the strategy we have pulled together over the last years, with a focus on connectivity, some of the things we're doing on the remote side, our geological care being moving the omnichannel side forward, we're in a strong position, as well as on the product side. So sustaining that advantage is critical for us, and that's part of our focus as we go through the phase. But uh, we are quite confident that we can continue to be on the journey of winning market share in this attractive market. With that, I would open it up for questions, and Thomas is going to help us how to do that. Sure. Operator, um, we're ready for the questions. If you can go to the queue, please. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touch to the telephone. Participants are requested to use only hands while asking a question. The first question comes from the line of Daniel Buchta von Tobel. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for taking my two questions. Um, the first one may be on your April figures you provided. Thanks for that. Um, I'm positively surprised on the number in the U.S. Um, 35% of normal sales um, is, is quite positive in my view, given um, how the news were. Um, can you say a little bit more? Where does the, this come from? Is it from larger chains like Costco, which are probably still open because they are offering much more than just hearing aids? Um, and then the second question, maybe a bit more is it possible for you to provide a generalized answer on how much capacity in an audiological care store um, might be lost if everything is, has normalized again, um, given stricter hygiene rules, distancing and everything? Um, is it 10, 15, 20 percent less of appointments you can do? Thank you very much. Um, 
Tanya, thank you. So April on the U.S., it was clearly not VA, as you have seen from the VA numbers. That volume was pretty much down. I think Costco was also, uh, I, I go of memory, but clearly below the average was showing here. Costco first had moved people to helping to sell the things people were stocking up at home. And they're now having a very, uh, let's say, methodological approach to opening a, a number of stores every week. So it, it is pretty much more the independence and our own audiological care, which has done better here. It's very different by, by, by state. Some of the states have seen volumes which were above 50 percent, uh, even during the, 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 the challenging times here. On the, on the lost capacity for the higher hygiene uh, we don't see that as such a big issue. I know it gets discussed a lot in hospitals, but in our place, um, as long as we get the booking done well and we do all the appointments before, uh, the procedure as such take 45 minutes for a fitting session will take 45 minutes. I think you're greeting the person at the entrance, they get a mask, they have to clean their hand, but the procedure itself doesn't change for us. So we don't see this as a significant loss. And then the other one, I think as much as we would like to, we're not always at 100% utilization in the store. So we're not as tacted as a hospital. So I, we don't see that as a, as a major contributor here. Thank you so much, that's very helpful. You're welcome. Next question comes from the line of Sebastian Walker, UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my questions. I've got two as well. So the, the first one was, I, I was wondering whether you could give any flavor on, on what you've seen in the first half of May versus April. Um, if not, you, you made a comment on, on scheduling. Did I hear correctly that going forward, you've got around 30 to 60% of your normal scheduled uh, uh, normal appointment scheduled, um, how is that split across geographies? So that's, that's the first one. The second one is just on, on product launches, given we've seen OIHA uh, postpone the conference or Congress since 2021. Does that change at all how you're going to be approaching uh, product launches for the remainder of the year? Thanks. Sebastian, thank you. So on the scheduling, the 30 to 60 was the range which we've seen uh, between Austria, Germany, Netherlands, which I, I quoted as the first ones in Europe. Gotcha. Um, okay. I, I think a slight pickup in, in uh, April, but not in a drastic form if I look at the global level. I think we're seeing some markets starting to move and there's initial good reaction to that, but as a 30 to 60 would indicate, not at the normal level. And from a product launch perspective, um, I think in general we're executing our roadmap. And um, so we have the discussion internally, what would we go do if we're still at the tail end of COVID and what's the percentage of revenue? I would say in the current time, you wouldn't launch in a market in which you're just at 20 to 30%. If you're in the 60 to 70, probably different discussion because you also need some draw to get people into the store and you hate to give up your time to market. So uh, I, I think we're executing the plan. We keep the option open of delaying something. Our slight preference would be to launch if we have something to launch because we know how important time to market advantages in the market is and having it on the shelf for six months and losing that six months against one of our most loved competitors probably also a bad economical decision. Got it. That's, that's really helpful. If I could just ask a follow-up then, kind of thinking about the end of the year, do you, is, it, is your base case scenario, assuming no second wave, is your base case scenario that, that we're kind of flattish year on year? Do you expect the end of the year, you know, in October, November, December down? Or, or what are your thoughts on, on the very end of the year in terms of volumes? I think you rather than thinking about a second wave, I think the thing which keeps us busy from a thinking perspective is, yes, we will see movement coming back, but, but what's the balance between pent-up demand versus economical pressure and compression? Yeah. So, flattish would be a good scenario in my eyes, feeling a little bit more cautious, Yeah, but 
Thanks very much. Next question comes from the line of Maya Pataki from Kepler. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> Arnd, I would like just uh, like to come get back to the last question and, you know, the outlook for the year and um overall when you you know your statements are not as negative as uh, some of your peers are sounding, you're also indicating that you're thirty five percent activity from last year. Your peers are talking more about twenty percent and you're you're giving the uh, the economy as an argument for not seeing really a recovery. Although, uh, you know, given the age range, the economy shouldn't really play so much into it. So, what is your biggest fear? Is it that audiologists are actually some of the audiologists will go bust because they will have to face a prolonged air, uh, period where there are no customers, or that the fear factor is keeping people out, or just to understand what it really is, what could be slowing the market, and maybe also answer why you are seeing better better numbers in April compared to your competitors. And then on your online offering, which is obviously very, uh, very attractive in, in such times, how aggressively are you pushing it in your own stores, and is that really something that you believe in and believe will stay, or do you think this is just a temporary... Um, tool for the market. Thank you. Hi, Maya. Thank you for the questions. So on the better numbers, I don't have a good explanation. Um, I, I think we did have a good momentum and that built over the last year. So that may be one. I think the other one, I think you, you really need to look where people have significant market shares and positions relative to how are the markets doing. Um, and and our AC network is pretty much main Europe, but uh, with a little bit more focus on the markets we're picking up earlier here, or weren't as low. I think on wholesale we also have a stronghold uh, in share more in uh, certain parts of Europe than the US. So this may be one explanation. I, I have not run the numbers. Um, from an outlook perspective, no, it is actually what I, what I said. I think um, this is quite a substantial economical crisis and we're discussing COVID and that's the first step of the equation but then it is quite some burden on, on uh, healthcare, on, on, on governments. It, it is also uh, an, an impact to people in how they perceive uh, their willingness to spend significant amounts and we just don't, don't have the answer um, but, but there tends to be some compression in our industry if you go back to 208, 209, where you can say, look, over the years after, it was muted. We were not in the 6 to 7% growth rate at that point of time. So I think it's just, I think it's something to keep in mind. We still have 75 to 80% is uh, out of pocket pay, right? Um, the, um, the last one was on the, on the, on the uh, Online. audiology side. Look, um, I think we're true to what we said over the last years, which is we do want to provide an omni-channel, and we do want to provide an omni-channel of a high quality with a hearing care professional involved. But if somebody would choose to take the whole journey where it's possible uh, remote, that's okay with us. I think the two factors are we want to have the hearing care professional involved to do it well. And the second one is we'd like to get good prices for good product and service, right? And so in that frame, um, I think it's logical that our audiological care stores, as some independents, are trying everything at this point of time to see if they can catch some revenue. So in that regard, we're pretty active with it in certain markets where it's possible and where we have the right infrastructure. Um, but in that frame, I think it's a hearing care professional and we want to have a good price. The next question comes from the line of Michael Youngling. Morgan Stanley, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, all. Um, I have three questions. Firstly, on new product launches, how do you view 2020 as a year for launching new products? Does it make sense? And if so, 
under what conditions um, would that would that be? Secondly, on audiologists, can you comment on what the legal requirements are for audiologists to return to your stores if they feel it's unsafe? And what is the return rate of audiologists in your stores? And then finally, uh, on the online hearing aid test, uh, do you have data comparing how good the results are of the online test versus a test in a store? Thank you. Hi, Michael. Thanks for the questions. So on the product side, I think if we would be a player who has a product up their sleeves for the fall season, and if you would like to hit the VA window with it, I think if you're on the range where you see a momentum in the 60 70%, I would go do this. Now, I think the VA window is, is a is a is a mechanistic uh, a mechanics in our world. If you're at 60 to 70 at that point of time, you assume you get to 80 and 90. And again, I think you need to create excitement to getting people in the store. So, uh, I would go do this in this frame. Um, from a legal requirement with regard to the audiologists, it depends on the country. Interestingly, we do not have that issue. I think we've laid out the safety concept in store, which our audiologists buy into. Uh, we had done quite some work early on to get all of the safety and protective uh, equipment in place. Uh, as I said, we went very quickly to it's only two people in the store. And uh, keep in mind, they are caretakers. They want to take care about the consumer. That's why they chose the profession. So in many cases, we have people who say, I need to make sure I come enough hours so that the people who need a repair or need some help are getting help. So we really, I haven't heard any case. There may be the few, but we don't have that issue on a broader scale. Um, from an online test perspective, I think the diagnostics you do with a patient uh, has some physical elements with otoscopy where you're checking out the ear. They have certain elements where it's more of a verbal checkup where you go through certain tests and, and see the reaction and you get a lot of input from the, from the person. And then there is some uh, more, let's say, electronic testing in some shape or form. Um, I, I think you're not at a point right now where you get the full quality and the full benefit. I think you can do an initial fitting, but uh, we believe right now that if somebody wants a hearing aid right now, that's good enough to get started, but we would advise them to come back uh, at some point of time into the store to do the missing pieces. So I, I think, I don't know how to put a number around it, but you probably get 70, 80% of the benefit, but there is a couple of steps you have to do. Keep in mind for the severe to profound, you normally also need to, that, that's where the whole chain doesn't work. You need to have an earpiece, which is, uh, uh, made specifically for the individual. Okay, thank you. So, so if I look at slide 33 and you highlight the sort of new launch for an online hearing aid test, um, does this mean that the patient is only going to be maybe 60 or 70 percent as satisfied as they would have been if they go into a store? No, I wasn't saying the satisfaction level. I think if you give that patient and now comes a question, did they have a hearing aid, did they not? If this would be a new patient and they didn't have a hearing aid and I give them a phonak marvel with, with all the things I can do here, they would probably say, wow, this is really good. And I would think I can even make it better. So look at it more as my quality standard I would put on my audio on how much they can fine tune it. But I would not worry that you're ending up at a place where they say this is really not worth me doing it. Okay. I'm just sort of curious about the return rate. If, if it's only 60, 70 percent, maybe the return rate ends up being quite high and it's in two or three months' time. Yeah, I understand, Michael. And, and it's certainly something we keep a close eye. Keep in mind, we now close this loop. As I said, it's from the initial tier. This is not like a firestorm. There are certain consumers open for that. But clearly, it will educate us on how happy are they measured in satisfaction and later return rate. So we watch it carefully. We have not done that in all countries, so not a big risk here right now. But I think in the places where you can do it, you can't do the full process in some of the countries. Great. Thank you.
The next question comes from the line of Kitty Lee Jeffries. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have two, please. Uh, the first question is just around uh, some of the cost uh, containment measures that you, you've laid out. Can you just quantify um, how much savings uh, that's going to be, either for the month of April or May, also for uh, maybe for the rest of the year as well? Uh, and then my second question uh, is, is coming back on uh, the remote fitting or the remote solutions. I guess of the sales that you've done in April, how much of that was done through remote solutions? And how do you think the adoption will grow uh, in the current situation for the rest of the year? Thank you. All right, thank you for the question. So on the cost side, looking on April, and, and, and keep in mind we were, we were, I would say, pretty draconian, except for the R&D and the backfilling on sales and audio positions. Um, order of magnitude, we were able to compress our OPEX by about 35%. About 20% of that is out of government subsidies, so you can see we're pushing very hard because most of it didn't come from the government subsidies. Is this longer term sustainable? I think at such a low business volume where you don't need to do lead generation, it would be. I think you need to be careful that while some markets are opening up because we didn't allow any lead generation, you would start to get your feet wet in, in that. But that was kind of the order of magnitude. On the Cox side, we were able to get out about 45%. So you can see there's still quite some fixed elements in our cost of goods sold. I think that would probably improve because uh, we put measures in place end of March. So for that, it's, I think, quite a good read-through of the cost side. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't plan with this off the bat when I want to drive some recovery. Now, on the remote side, Small numbers, relatively speaking. I, I think we, we are excited for trying. I think we are excited to offer the consumer, you have two choices. You can go all remote, or we can get you a process in which you come to the store and we handle you safely. I think the majority picks the I come safely to the store side, as I said. So I, I think not a significant number. I think we will learn over the next couple of months. But But again, I think the vast majority of consumers rather waits until you can open the door, which in, in more and more markets we're able to do. Okay, no, that, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. The next question comes from the line of Veronica Dubayava, Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for taking my questions. I have three, please. Um, I actually want to start first um, asking about the cochlear implant business, and I don't know... Um, are and how you, how you are thinking about this, but looking at the impact of the voluntary recall, it seems to have been a bit more severe than you anticipated. So, so I guess just your thoughts on the achievability of some of the medium-term targets that you've laid out for this business, including you know getting to a double-digit profitability. Do you think either COVID or this is going to have an impact, and how you're thinking about that? You know, business on a two to five-year outlook that would be that would be helpful. So that's my first question. Um, my second question is just a follow up on the return of traffic that you have seen in the markets where you've seen that, if you can characterize kind of the mix between new customers and returning customers who are coming in for fine tuning or, you know, an upgrade, um, it would help us understand kind of what you're seeing on the ground. So anything you can share on that would be helpful. And then I'll have one follow up after that, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Veronica. Um, on the CI side, you catch me on an uncomfortable foot because I was the one who said, well, we can turn this business around. Um, so for the two to five, there is no reason why we cannot get this business to 15% and afterwards to meaningful numbers with a two in front. Right? There, there's, there's none. It's a high margin business. We've done good progress. You may remember we had 400 basis points um, uh, year over year for two years for every half year. Uh, now, from the voluntary field corrective action, it is very hard for us to depict what is now the voluntary field corrective action versus what's the COVID side. I think in the recovery of customers who were willing to, while they were not in COVID, reorder or now 
are clearly on the path of planning with us, and we can see that when they talk with people who are waiting for surgery, we feel good about that. It, it was not expected that you had 100% at this point of time. I think, if any, our team would say, well, COVID puts it in perspective, and the surgeons may forget a little faster that they were frustrated with us. Yeah. But it's the sum of the two. And I think we need to get through the back to all buying from us. We also need to see how the COVID evolves. So I, I don't think you're going to see us this year at the 15%. I think that's already the start wasn't good enough. But I think in the one to two years time frame, which I need to add to my timeline, which was this year, I think is what the game plan is. From the traffic perspective, it is predominantly consumers whom we have in the database, meaning people who are at the four to six years. So the first one is we're going after the people who what I called aborted the sales process because they were early. So those are the normal mix because these are leads which we had convinced and they just stopped the process. I think the second one we go after is the consumers who are renewing because we can size them more from an analytics perspective, we can call out, we can use our audios. So it's cost effective. We, we have not driven significant volumes of new consumers. I think we're starting to think about in the markets where we see more traffic, but right now it's pretty much existing. And I would venture to guess that's true for everyone who's not out with big campaigns at this point of time. Now your last question. Yes, um, my last question was was sort of a clarification around some of the comments you've made on the cost reduction, and in particular, I'm struck by your COGS um, reduction to 45% or so. Um, my understanding of of the hearing aid businesses was that they had a fairly small variable at a high fixed component when it comes to manufacturing. So maybe can you give us a little bit of insight of how you've gotten to this 45% plus reduction is it that you've reduced your manufacturing capacity and furloughed some folks, um, and just you know how we should be thinking about that cost line coming back as you move through um, the next couple of months. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're pointing to the right places. You have the material side, which is a smaller percentage. But um, labor is still quite a number in our world because uh, all of the hearing aids get hand assembled. That's why we have Vietnam and China, right? And so there are significant opportunities you have in Vietnam and China, also, by the way, here in uh, Stefa, as well as in our American center. And so we went very aggressively after reducing the hours. Uh, in the in the country available model in Switzerland, there will be Kurzarbeit. In AODC, that would be furlough. Yeah, but we have very significantly reduced uh, the hours in the factory, and that together gave us this 45 percent. Understood. And how quickly do you think you'll need to ramp that up? I think we're seeing uh, on the repair side more units coming in than in the first, so we're starting to ramp up more on the repair side. And I think we, we will see a pickup uh, over the next two to three months um, in repair as well as some new products. So I think the 45% is the low point what we can do from the hours. Understood. Thank you very much, guys, and hope you stay safe. Thank you. Same to you. The next question comes from the line of Chris Kretler, Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I actually, I still have no three questions left. Hi, Tom. Hi, Andre. Okay. Um, hi. Um, one is you not know, on supply chain, you know, since you touched it. You know, actually, how comfortable do you feel, you know, with, you know, your a substantial part of your supply chain, you know, concentrated in Asia, you know, these days, you know, with all, you know, what's been going on. You know, we had tariffs, you know, on the year. Um, before, I think already kind of, and now basically with all, you know, kind of, of these health issues, etc. Is the company considering, you know, um, any potential changes, you know, um, going forward, you know? That would be the first question. I'd probably take it one after the other. So. Yeah. So from a tariff perspective, because that discussion was with us a year ago, we're pretty comfortable because we have the ability to shift volumes depending on the geo we deliver to between the different sites. And, and uh, in that regard, having 
three main mass manufacturing plus the U.S. makes us safe relative to anything which may come out of the U.S., right? And, and, and Europe is not as aggressive. I think from a, from a potential future um, pandemic perspective, I think our initial reaction would be we're not that worried um, because at least in this one we could see that from a product perspective and manufacturing pers uh, from a product movement perspective there was no limitations and I wouldn't expect this with a with an infection and uh, from a manufacturing perspective having four is safer than having two even if two are in Asia. So I, I would feel better about that. Um, it was interesting. We had in the whole China factory, um, until two weeks ago, I haven't checked in the last two weeks, no COVID case amongst 1,000 people, nor did we have a reported one in the families. And they, they have to report this every day and they get measured every day. So um, I, I'm, I'm not so sure where you're safer. Uh, given the different lockdown scenarios people are able to implement, and we can like or dislike certain countries, but the lockdown scenarios in China are pretty effective. So I, I feel good about having four rather than having two just in the Western world. Then, you know, the, the second question relates to, you know, kind of structural cost adjust adjustment. You know, I mean, I notice now, you know, basically we are kind of running kind of low on cost because you now we kind of, you know, using government monies, et cetera, and, you know, kind of doing some kind of um, um, near-term cost savings. You know? But under, what, what would be the trigger points, you know, that you would look at, you know, um, when, you know, you would, you know, decide on actually adjusting costs, you know, um, structurally? So, I mean, we have already seen some you know, this company, for example, are doing you know kind of you know, headcount reductions, etc. I'm just interested in your thought process. You know, kind of what would be kind of the key indicators, you no know, kind of that you would monitor. I think we're in a different position than the Swiss company you're, you're naming there with Straumann. Um, I think you remember we're discussing structural optimizations and have two steps which we've done already as part of our strategy and. I think there's still opportunity in Sonova, and and I think you have to pick uh, the ones at the right point of time. It's not a knee-jerk reaction on some compression at some point of time. There's different ways in how you can manage your P&L, but in, in principle, we, we still have things in mind which we want to go do over the next two years. Now, in the current time, you may feel invited to do a little faster, a little more, but but in principle... I think less of a COVID reaction, but more of uh, when is the right time for us to pick the next ones which we have in mind and, and, and what does it take to implement them without breaking the stability of your business. We don't have one which would be so big that one project alone could do it. That's why we also did already two steps because I think an organization can't do too many at the same time. So expect us more to be on the same plan we were before. Uh, we have a couple of things we want to go do, and we will do them over the next couple of half years. Okay. Um, and maybe the last question is just on the re rechargeable ratio. You know, Could you maybe elaborate on that, in particular also what you had you know, in terms of negative you know, effect on gross margin in uh, the full year or in the second half? You know? Um, just basically to see where we stand there and, you know, kind of maybe also comment about, you know, using rechargeables more um, towards the lower end of your product range. It would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we always made the rechargeable available to um, all of the different performance levels in the brand. So at this point of time, everybody has a rechargeable option. We're clearly above the 70%, and we expect this to move gradually to the 90. Is that in six months or is that in 12? I don't know, but in principle, I think rechargeable is, is, will be the dominant mode. Um, I think from the gross margin, it's a little hard to pick it out in detail. I think we had a significant step up in rechargeable ratio in the first half last year because on Marvel we were uh, on um, on uh, pre-Marvel 
we were in the range of, I go of memory, 40% or so, and we stepped up to 70. So I think the headwind wasn't as big in the second half as it was in the first half, and that's what we shared also why we expected a better fall through, not just because of it, but that was one of the reasons. So I think more steady changes which were countering through productivity. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Marcus Gola. Main first. Please go ahead. Hi, and thank you for taking my question. So my first one is on your guidance, and I understand that you currently can only provide uh, qualitative statements. However, at what point in time can we expect you to quantify your guidance? Uh, will this just happen with the next half-year results, or can we expect an ad hoc update once your uh, visibility improves? And my second question is on Costco. I wonder whether you could provide us with yeah, some ballpark figures of visibility about your unit market share there and maybe how that has evolved in your view since you have been awarded with the KS9 contract. Thank you. Marcos, thanks for the questions. So on the, on the guidance perspective, um, I think it would be logical to have far more clarity when we come with the next half year results. Um, if we feel in a far more stable situation or something has significantly changed relative to what we're flagging here, we would um, uh, do the extraordinary step, which we normally don't do to inform in between. Um, on the Costco side, uh, I think it's pretty stable in the share of wallet within Costco since we launched our product there. Um, and in Costco, you tend to be 50% tends to be on the uh, KS side and 50% on the on the um, on the branded side. Um, our product sits so well in the channel that we're doing somewhat better than that normal 50%, but it's pretty stable from all we can tell. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marcos. Next question comes from the line of Daniel Yelovkan. Mirabo, please go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, also three. Uh, the first one, the VA market share just significantly declined in April, but also the volume was very low, actually at 10 or 15 percent of the normal level. Can you clarify a bit why this was the case and also when do you expect uh, more VA activity in general? And the second one, can you uh, uh, also give some indications how your wireless business um, developed? I guess it was quite good as well. And the third question is on the waiting list. Uh, I mean, with your insight in your own retail, uh, um, is there a waiting list? So, for instance, in dentistry, some dentists are uh, occupied for the next two months already booked out. Do you see some similar things in, in your own uh, Audiologies channels, that are the three questions, thanks. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for the questions. On the VA side, the VA overall has closed the, uh, the fitting uh, in almost all of the centers the VA operates by themselves. Now, there's a small portion normally at high volumes of the VA where the work is contracted out to normal independence. And now I experience uh, in a world of normal independence, independents te tend to have a preference for a certain manufacturer. So we believe what we're seeing with the market share drop at such a low volume is a far higher share of this independent fitting going on, where ultimately it's the audiologist who kind of chooses what they do. And uh, we do not have... 50% plus market share in the U.S. on the independent market. So that's how we were wrapping our head around it. Obviously, important to see uh, what, what's going to happen if the volumes go up. Um, I think it's unclear to us at this point of time when the VA goes back in normal operation mode. We see the independents being more eager or the commercial channels more eager than the VA people to reopen stores. On the waiting list side, um, Overall, we do not have long waiting lists. If, if not, we would have less kurzarbeit 
and we would have more revenue. It could well be that uh, in a particular store, they would just have a larger number of people who want to come. Um, but we're quite sensitive, and in almost all countries where we use Kurzarbeit, we can on a daily or weekly basis flex up the hours. But we're clearly not in the waiting list environment yet. Hardwick on the wireless, do you have a read on the... Well, wireless is a little bit more, uh, let's say, uh, within the year cyclical uh, because there is a, quite a share of school business uh, that is very low in summer and uh, is uh, higher towards the end of the year. Um, we launched a new version of our Roger business, Ro Roger product uh, last year that is uh, running very well, uh, accelerated our growth uh, in fall last year. Um, and uh, within uh, the COVID uh, movement, also new contracts were um, you know, hampered quite a bit because, you know, uh, customers, be it different schools, et cetera, were not available, but our existing contracts continued. So I, I would say a little bit their own dynamics, but the good product level uh, uh, momentum there, uh, Daniel. Okay, thanks. And just on the VEA again, uh, you have no indication when they will start or reopen for normal fitting, uh, even by the VEA? To the best of my knowledge, and I may be short of an update, I, I was not aware. Uh, Thomas is raising his hand. <laughs> no, I, I'm talking to our U.S. colleagues. Uh, it seems like at the earliest it would be in June. Okay, great. Thanks. The next question comes from the line of David Edlington, J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey guys, thanks for the questions. Uh, yeah, the first one, just on the uh, authorization for additional capital, I think 10%. Just wondered uh, if that additional capital, we should be thinking about that as being as raising money for either opportunity uh, or potentially on the risk side. Uh, and then secondly, just on OTC in the US, just wondered if it had any updates for us in terms of what's happening with the legislation there. Thanks. Hi, David. Thanks for the question. On the additional capital, I think from the purposing, we keep it relatively broad. If we get the approval from the shareholder base for that, uh, I think our initial, when we came up with this idea, and, and as you can tell also from our liquidity side, not all of the things we've done over the last couple of weeks were in the bank a couple of weeks ago. Um, our initial thought came more from the defensive side and saying, look, we just want to make sure that things are at our perusal if we need them. Um, I think if very attractive things would emerge, we would obviously think about it, but the, the initial came out of the defensive side. From an OTC perspective, no updates. We have not seen any document yet as a guidance document. Um, there was no significant signs on progress and it making it to the next uh, level at Congress or at the White House. So I think we're sitting here and right now it's a day for a day. I think our assumption is that you're talking earliest end of the year until early next year, because we know the times are, timelines for getting input and, and finalizing, but that would require them to come out rather sooner than later. Great, thanks very much. You're welcome. Next question comes from the line of Oliver Metzger, Commerce Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks a lot for taking my questions. I have three. The first one is uh, on retail. So over years, you have executed a pretty straightforward strategy to strengthen your retail network. So first, are there on the back of the current crisis any thoughts to revise the strategy? And second, do you see more, in contrast, even more opportunities uh, to grow externally now on the back of a challenging environment which might lead to some distressed situations for smaller players. My second question is uh, on the shape of a recovery. So in China, there is some recovery already visible. Do you see some strict structural differences between the shape of a recovery in China compared to other markets? 
And my last question is also about uh, the recovery re in VA. So you just said that uh, the stores are most likely uh, open up from June or not earlier than, than June. So the VA, the, the whole fitting process, the point process is quite structured. Do you think that this structured process will help that the VA market might recover much faster than the private markets? Um, Oliver, thank you for the questions. On the retail side, um, no, we have not seen a reason to revise our our general retail strategy. I, I think it's it's in line with what we said last year. Um, stores play a role. Obviously, more moves, on the, particularly on the lead gen side, into the digital world, and you need to build the capability. And then as people want to have some touch points remote, you need to put omni-channel in place. But no change to that. I, I don't see it from COVID. And as I said earlier, we haven't seen many people picking up a pure remote fitting as much as we're offering it. But many are waiting to get to the store. The, from an uh, opportunity perspective, um, we keep our eyes and ears open. Uh, but it's probably still a little early. Uh, particular, if you would think about larger assets, I, I think on the one to five stores, probably. Um, but we, we need to get the balance right here between being selective while we want to make sure we're safe on the on the cash side. But but I think there will be a phase in which probably more opportunities come along, could be also outside of retail. Um, from a Structural change of recovery, China versus the Western world, allow me to put this in a broad basket. As much as I said, every country is different. I think from the outside, clearly China was very draconian on the lockdown. And I think China has the ability to mobilize the population more centrally than the average Western country. I hope that's fair to say. I don't want to step too much into a political debate. Yeah. So in that regard, I, as much as I like what looks like a fast recovery in China, I'm not so sure you will see exactly the same curve in other countries. So I'd rather be a little bit more careful in my thinking. We clearly look at China to see what we can learn. But for us, the Austrias, the Germanys, the Netherlands are probably better proxies and what you've seen in China. So in, in general, probably a little bit more muted from the curve. On the VA recovery perspective, I, I'm just guessing or assuming, but because they're holding longer tight, apparently, I would expect they have more people who are waiting until they open, right? And so they, they have a, quite a number of people who know they're up for renewal of a hearing aid, and that's a big part of their of their job. And so I, I would I would think the longer they wait, the more the people build the waiting lines. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Next question comes from the line of Falco Friedrich, Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Thank you. I would have two questions, please. Uh, firstly, also on OTC. Do you think the current environment will increase the appetite for OTC hearing aid solutions, or do you think it rather, rather pushes it further away? And then secondly, regarding your allowance for bad debt, have you already noticed customers not being able to pay, or is that something you rather anticipate over the next few months? Marco, thanks for the questions here. On the OTC, uh, not on the basis of of a good VOC analysis, but from the conversations we have in the markets where we see people coming back and from the conversations of people saying, hey, hearing loss, particular in times of physical distancing, is actually more important and they feel more separated. I think we rather see people putting more value about a good service and a good solution. Again, this is not based on VOC, but I, I would have no indication why I would assume that because of COVID, OTC will have a higher penetration than without COVID. Um, and again, I think you can, as we have laid out with 
the new solution of an audiogram direct and the better remote and all that we can offer people if it comes to um, convenience from for a high-end system, we can offer more as we go. I think from a bad debt perspective, um, I'd probably leave it to Hardwick. He's still closer to managing that side of the house. Yeah, Falco, no, it's, it's, it's more of a precautionary measure. Uh, it reflects um, a, a reasonably detailed analysis of our mostly independence and uh, buying group accounts. That's where this concentrated on. So, you know, we are just want to be on the cautious side here, but it's not that we uh, have write-offs at this point. Okay, thanks very much. You're welcome. Next question comes from the line of Charles Benoit, Lock Hill Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, two quick questions for me. Can you please remind us what is the replacement share in terms of volumes for hearing aids. And I think you mentioned that out-of-pocket accounted for roughly 70% of uh, of the price of devices. Is that correct? So replacement share, you mean from everyone we sell, how much is a replacement versus a new consumer? Correct. Yeah. I I think you're in the range of probably a little bit above 50% being replacements. I'm just going off average age of people when they get the first hearing aids. So I'd say probably around 60% is replacement, 40% is new, new consumer. Out of pocket, um, I said 75 to 80. It's, it's actually higher than 70, particularly because many people get a reimbursement, but they tend to buy the higher performance level. So in most markets, you get the reimbursement as granted, and then you pay up. Got it. So in practice, it's 70 to 80 percent. Yeah. Okay. Super. Thank you. You're welcome. We have a follow-up question from Maya Pataki from Kepler. Please go ahead. Yes. Thanks for taking my follow-up question. Just, uh, just out of interest, uh, aren't if you and your management? Do you anticipate to to see a difference in consumer behavior in those markets where you've seen uh, the environment being hit hard? So basically, the countries that you've now mentioned have been, you know, seen a fairly okay situation, rather than if we look at UK, uh, France. Uh, Italy and some uh, some areas in Spain, uh, some areas in the U.S. Do you think there will be a significant difference in how consumers behave? Um, I think relative to hard hit from a let's say infection and mortality rate, I I would not. I I think I think it's relevant to see how much fear was created and the way people have communicated and have guided through. I would venture to guess if you have a double, if, it, if you have a redip, then you're probably longer out until they come back. But so far we haven't seen that. So for me it comes more down to what are the economics and where people get the money from. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There are no more questions. Okay, so then we conclude this call. Thanks for the engagement, the questions, um, the interaction here. And we wish everybody a good rest of the day and stay uh, healthy and safe. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is now over. Thank you for choosing Car School and thank you for participating in the conference. You may not disconnect your lines. Goodbye.